Okay. So, inclusive fitness. So, Charles Darwin. So this, this, so this presentation has a few like massive chunks of indigestible text. It's worth reading. Um, normally, we don't do that, but here we are. Um, who's read *The Origin of Species*? Uh, no. Uh, it's really good. Um, <laughs> once you get past the pigeon stuff, it's actually pretty compelling. It's really cool to see you know, how he's building up this strong case using all these different lines of evidence. It's really a beautiful example. Um, and if you, you know, like you know, half-page sentences, it's really, really pretty good for that, too. But it's, it's definitely worth reading. Um, <coughs> but here's a quote from it. Okay. I will not here enter on these several cases, but put myself to one special difficulty, which at first seemed to me insuperable and actually fatal to my whole theory. Right? So what could be fatal to evolution that everyone's thinking about? <coughs> is it the eye? No, that's okay. Um, what is it? Well, inclusive fitness. All right. So, <coughs> all right. So let's take ants. So ants have casts, right? And so you'll have <coughs> here is a queen ant. Um, still has their wings, right? A male ant and then a worker ant. And even among worker ants, they can melt with casts. Right? So leafcutter ants have you know, big workers that go out and chop the leaves. And also, those little workers will sometimes ride on them and defend them against flies. Right? Or take care of eggs in the nest. And so, <coughs> I'll give you a chance to read this. I just need to notice the variation in reading speed in the class. Block normal, I think. Okay, who can explain this? What's he saying? What's the, what's the problem here? Yeah? Well, it's like the main idea is the natural selection is that you have one of your offspring in your tail and you have a cast. So the inclusion of the person in your tail is going to make your ants in your tail. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's so like leafcutter ants, when they're cutting the leaves. So I used to work on ants, so I like ants. And also, they're good at this. So here I have an ant, a leaf, and I have the ant cutting off the leaf to carry back to the nest, right? And so the ant is right here doing the cutting. About half the time, she's on the part being cut, which because of ah, falls to the ground, right? Now you can imagine a super smart worker evolving that always stays. On the leaf part, right? It doesn't lose, doesn't drop the leaf, right? Or fall off the leaf. And if you had the super smart worker, is she going to pass on anything? Pass on that trait to her offspring? No. No. Not necessarily. No. 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 I mean, workers don't have offspring at ants. Yeah. So uh, most ants is there's always exception to this life, but yeah. In, 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 especially in leaf cutter ants, they don't have offspring. And so the super smart worker is going to have as many offspring as a super stupid worker that just like you know chases down birds to get eaten, right? <coughs> so how does this trait get passed on? How does evolution work in this case? Or can it? Oh, um, it's 
crazy, many different things. I mean, so typically the queen's producing multiple queens and then aliens go off and fly out and form new colonies. When some species, um, there'll be multiple queens that work together, and so some of them might actually stay in the nest. Um, and some species, another queen will come in and try to kill the queen. Um, other species, some species, a, spe a queen of a different species will come in and kill the queen and, you know, treat the workers as slaves. Um, there's one, one species where the queen rides on the back of a different species queen, so it sneaks her eggs in. So it's all crazy. It's, it's, just, it's really cool. I mean, you know, 20,000 species of ants, like all of birds, the same number of birds. So it's pretty cool. Group. Yeah. Um, so, right, so what's the one mechanism we haven't talked about yet? All right, so queens that have dumb workers do worse than queens that have smart workers. Right? Colonies that have lots of smart workers do better than colonies with lots of dumb workers. Mm hmm Right? And if the intelligence is passed on, and so smart smart queens of smart colonies tend to have offspring queens that also produce smart colonies, then that's a heritable trait. Right? And so even though the individual being selected selection is happening on, you know, the workers are being smart or stupid, the colony as a whole has this fitness to transmit it via the queens. Right? So here's Darwin's explanation. Which will give you a feel and again, a huge chunk of text that's worth looking at. Through a sense of how Darwin argues in the origin of species. Okay, so what's Darwin talking about here? Right, so he has some words like the social insects where it's, you know, you have the group trait of, you know, colony efficiency of foraging. What about the vegetable and oxen examples? Right, because rel close relatives are similar and pass on offspring, so you can just constantly, you know, select on, you know, select, you know, based on the trait the trait values of one one individual, but then select on its relatives. All right. Um, any questions about that? That makes sense. Right. I mean, we see this all the time. And so, one of the cool things about Darwin is, first of all, he's cautious. Right. So the difficulty appears terrible. But his lesson, or I believe it's fixed, but you know, you might disagree, but I think it's fixed, but you know, just cautious. And then having examples people could, uh, could understand. Okay, you have a garden, right? Everyone has a garden. What is it? Let's talk about gardens. Oxes, okay. Um, <coughs> and then I can talk about, you know, the actual biological example. 
right? He's trying to connect to readers. Um, <coughs> right. So it explains how you can have selection for, you know, traits of things that you know don't have, pass on offspring. Now, does this explain why things might not have offspring? Why this selected for not having offspring? I see one nod yes, one nod not, one nod no. Yeah, yeah. So this passage explained why ant workers don't have offspring. I'll give a mechanism for what I might that might be. So the slide modification structure that's advantageous to the community is sterile. So that if they're sterile, it's advantageous to the community, and that's why they don't have offspring. Uh, it's the reverse. It's saying if they're already sterile, then you can still have modifications that help their fertile relatives. Where do the super long sentences come from? Yeah? To prevent overfertilization, do you have to uh, Maybe, but I mean, that's sort of the it's really strong group selection, right? Which is something that we typically don't go to unless we have to, as an explanation. Well, actually, it doesn't. It doesn't speak to why workers might be sterile, right? It says how if workers are sterile, their traits can still evolve through natural selection. It explains that part, but not um, how workers, you know, wh why workers would evolve to become sterile. Okay, we're going to talk about now, you know, why this might be advantageous to workers. This inclusive fitness thing. Okay. So just some jargon. Okay, um, actor. So physical individual performing behaviors, we'll talk about an actor, so in this case it could be like the worker ant, right? Altruism, okay, something that's costly to the actor, beneficial to the recipient, right? So you <coughs> dive into water to save a drown someone who's drowning, right? Makes you wet and cold, saves someone's life, right? Um, and <coughs> there's a question here about whether this means, you know, something that has an overall greater cost to you than overall benefit to you. So if you save your child, right, and get a little cold, it's probably worth your while, right? It can give you a benefit of having your genes passed on with your kid at the cost of making you a little cold, right? Is that considered altruism, or is you know, sacrificing yourself for a complete stranger, you know, killing yourself so they, they can be less, less cold in the water or something? Would that be, and that's sort of a, a stricter form of altruism, okay? Cheaters? <coughs> Sometimes will cooperate less than their fair share. Okay. Cooperation, behavior that benefits another recipient. Direct fitness, so how we normally calculate fitness, right? How many offspring you have that survives reproduce. Okay. Um, talk about being a bit later. Indirect fitness, fitness comes from related individuals, right? If, you're, if your sister has kids, you know, those kids have some of your genes, right? So if they do well, then some of your genes are passed on. Okay. Um, Kin selection, so process which traits are, fav are favored based on, you know, helping your kin because it's inclusive fitness there. Okay. And recipient, that was after the poem. Okay. <coughs> so here's the big idea, Hamilton's rule. Okay. So it's a very scary equation, has three letters in it. Right. <laughs> so, who's going to this? So, if I, well, what Right, so this is when do you choose to do a costly behavior? Right? And if this condition is satisfied, you do the costly behavior. Right? When do you dive into the water to save someone? And so relatedness is you know, you're really probably sharing a given gene. Okay. B is the benefit in fitness units, and C is the cost. And so benefit and cost have to be in the same units, right? And they can be in terms of the you know, number of individuals that persist or you know, survive or would die. Or it could be in units of how much time you're wasting versus how much time you're saving the recipient. It could be how much energy you're wasting versus how much energy is saved by the recipient. Okay? How many dead deer you get versus how many dead deer they get. Okay? Um, <coughs> the same time units. Okay? Um, why relatedness matter? 
What if those things aren't related at all? Will they just to zero? When should you do costly behavior? Right, so I have behavior, so let's say my benefit is so benefit to recipient is five, cost to me is in relatedness equals zero. Okay. So helps my friend hugely. Tiny cost to me, zero relatedness. Is Hamilton's rule satisfied? No. So R times B is zero. Zero is not greater than 0 0.001. Right? Or with zero 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 one. Right? So in that case, if zero relatedness, there's no benefit to helping at all. So in general that wouldn't be satisfied. Now <coughs> we talked about game theory the other time, the other day, right? And so with game theory, I don't necessarily need relatedness. I could still have an overall benefit to helping something, right? Um, but there still has to be, it may look like it has a cost, but also has a benefit, right? Let's, let's work together and take down this deer, and then work separately and take down two rabbits. So we're more, more meat in a deer, so there's some cost working together, the net benefit's greater. So still, in that case, then, the cost to me is less than the benefit to me, which doesn't fall into the purview of Hamilton's rule. So there's something on its own has a cost to me. Um, what about if I have benefit equals 5, cost equals 2, and relatedness equals 1 half? Do I take the action or not? Yes. Right? Because the left-hand side, 1 half times 5, 2 and a half, which is greater than 2. So even though now this is pretty costly compared to 0.0001, if we have some relatedness, it's to my benefit to take that action. Okay. Now again, our organism is sitting there and saying, okay, let's see. So we're related, but we're the second cousins on my mother's side, and this will, no. It's just that organisms that have evolved this certain behavior, you know, that help in this condition, do better than those that don't, or vice versa. Right? So natural selection is continuing tuning things by having them have more or fewer offspring. And so here, actor and recipient, right? So it has direct fitness, right? Here are my babies, okay? But also indirect fitness, right? I help my second cousin with her kids, right? And <clears throat> does that count as much, as much as helping me with my own kids? No, right? How do we discount that? We discount that by the relatedness. It depends on how much help their kids need. Right? So, I mean, if their kids are going to die because, you know, they're mammals and they're not producing any milk, and you, you know, give them, some, give them a den, they're still going to die, then, right, it's a waste of effort. But then there's no benefit to the recipient either. Right? Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? I think so. But if all things being equal, then, and the recipient. It could possibly still be worth it. Oh, okay. If the cost is low enough. If the cost is low enough, or the benefit of the recipient is high enough. Right? It doesn't matter what the recipient is doing, right? Does it be an octopus sacrificing itself for, an for their offspring, or a cod just dumping eggs in the ocean and swimming on? Right? What matters is how your investment helps benefit that one. Okay. Yeah. Good. Other questions about this? Okay, so there's a cool legend about this. Um, Haldane, who involved developing this theory, um, said he would jump in a river and risk his life to save two brothers, but not one, and he would jump to save eight cousins, but not seven. Right? Do you not like odd numbers? What was his thinking here? 
you expect your brother to have like half of your genes because mm -hmm. like Orlando was stolen from your parents? And he's, um, so if it's two brothers, it's like the same as your life, so it's like his brothers. And then eight cousins is the same relatedness as like one set. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's the, the trade off. Yeah. Did he factor in that they had offspring or not? So is that something that you thought about? No, that doesn't, it's not, um, well, I mean, if they're, you know, eight-year-old men are done having kids, then, right, you're not going to have any benefit. So, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, so the reproductive value of individuals can matter in this, yeah, which is the simple rule we, simple rule we don't take into account, but, yeah. Good. Other questions about this? Okay, so this whole overall approach to looking at direct fitness and indirect fitness been attacked a little bit, okay? And so, in response, there was a Nature article that was just, you know, saying, yes, that's important. Um, and so, you know, where has this inclusive fitness theory been important? Been important, right? Everywhere you look. <coughs> sex allocation, yes. So when we talked about those bark beetles that have a female bias sex ratio, which is most things we think about, it's because of the because of fitness of males. That, it's brothers and sisters, right? And with the city mating, the fitness incentives change. Okay. Um, policing, right? So worker bees go around, and sometimes worker bees can lay eggs, and if a sister finds her sister's laying eggs and she's not the queen, she kills the eggs. Why is that? Worker, because they get more benefit from having the mother's eggs, eggs raised than the sister's eggs raised. Right. Conflict resolution, cooperation, altruism, spite, we talked about. Um, parasite virulence, it's interesting. So, you know, we're now worried about Ebola, um, enterovirus 53 or something, right? So these viruses going around. And one cool thing about disease is that you can see it actually evolving in real time. Okay. And we see, depending on um, conflict within a host versus between hosts, we can see viruses evolving virulence. Right? So, <coughs> if a virus, if you have you know, you're typically infected by multiple strains, right? Then they start have to have to compete over, you know, who's going to win over this body, right? So the one that's the most virulent, that first opens the most cells and infects the most things, will do best, right? If you're infected by, by a single virus or a single bacterium, then all the ones that are growing in the body are very closely related to that, right? And you'd be better off by attacking you less slowly and having you be infectious for longer before you die, right? So then, the, the because you know I might grow much slowly, but then my sister also grows more slowly, and she, you know I help her reproduce more, and she helps me reproduce more. Right? And so my overall fitness might be higher by being less virulent. Okay. <coughs> and you actually see diseases evolving in this way. Okay. Okay. Um, Population of elements, so you know you have parasites in your genome that hop around and copy themselves and things like that. Cannibalism, dispersal, alarm calls, eusociality, and genomic fermenting. Yeah. So, <coughs> lots of animals are social, right? Eusociality is taken to the extreme. Right? We have some individuals that do the reproduction, other individuals that work through the working. We have overlapping generations. Okay? So, things like ants, termites, naked mole rats. Um, what? Bees, yep. Uh, some bees. Some bees actually are, so, are, are solitary bees, like bumblebees. Um, but like honeybees, definitely. Yeah. I um, want to bring that's interesting because bees, you can see it fl flipping back and forth. And so you can see when do we evolve these sociality, when we lose it. It's a cool example. Um, there's some examples of, this, one probably example of some shrimp that look inside sponges that recently found. Um, I don't know what other groups there are that are use social. It's pretty rare. Yeah. Oh, <coughs> um, so if you're a parent and you have you have multiple matings, right? So your female have multiple matings, then your offspring are half sibs, right? Potentially half sibs. So relatedness is um, not one half; it's uh, three, uh, one quarter, right? With each other. Whereas you are related one half to each of your offspring. And so for that offspring, it might want to, you know, it's, it's being selected for taking all the resources itself, right? Whereas for the parent, 
the might be selected for having some resources for that offspring and some resources for another offspring. So, well, so the siblings have a conflict, but also between what's the best best allocation of resources for the parent. You know, I want to divide it fairly across all my children, and what's the best resource best for a given offspring? I want you to give all all give all the goodies to me. And so, you know, if you think about birds begging for food, the parent comes back to the nest, has a nice juicy worm, all the offspring are begging. Um, you know, for the parent, it probably wants to it would be advantageous to raise you know each of them with equal amounts of food and have two you know pretty good offspring. Okay. But for me, I want to take all the all the food myself and leave my sister. So this, this is no, so this is so. There, there's that simply a sibling conflict between the bird and baby bird, but the parent offspring conflict is between them. All the bird and baby bird. Yep. Yeah. Good. That makes sense. Other questions about this? Okay. And I mean, the cool thing about this is you have experimental data, correlational data, and you know some theory data. So a lot of things we say, okay, this could work in theory. You go in nature and say, oh, wow, it does not work here. Right? So a lot of these things we can go actually test them directly and find out, like, yes, they are working or no, they're not. Okay. Um, <coughs> and another good test of a theory is, does it make predictions you can go test? Right? So I could have you know, some sort of regression equation that, that explains lots of variation. It doesn't tell me what to do next when I have a new situation. Right, whereas this theory has predicted, you know, workers killing queens, or exclusion of non-kin, or how hard individuals work in a colony, right? As many predictions, you can go off and test them with different studies. Okay. So, for example, workers killing queens, right? Has it been studied experimentally? No. So something, at least when this was published a couple of years ago. So you go off and Test this directly yourself. And what, the reason we do that sort of thing in biology is so you can go off and find out that we're wrong. Right? And that's, that's cool. We then you find out, okay, we thought we didn't do something about the world, but now there's something else we have to explain. Let's go figure out why that violates our theory. Right? Um, it helps us just learn more. Okay. So biologists are always testing our theories by going out, not to study confirm them, but just sort of you know, find out there's stuff we don't know yet. Okay. Um, <coughs> which makes you know, science very interesting. Okay, and just showing you, so here's you know all the authors in this paper that defending inclusive fitness, and science isn't done by democracy. It's not based on popular, you know, number of people who are voting for it. Even so, though, this is this suggests that the current state of the field suggests that people like inclusive fitness because right? some people sign on to this paper. Okay. So here's an example where we can look at <coughs> fitness. So I'm going to have a solitary worker and I have you know, me that is social. Okay. And the question is, <coughs> um, would a worker do better by having you know, more offspring herself, being solitary, or helping her sister produce offspring? Right. And so the way you figure that out is looking at the inclusive fitness so look at the conclusion, first of all, the relatedness between the worker and the queen's offspring, right? Um, <coughs> and the worker and her own offspring, right? And then you can figure out the overall fitness based on this. They find that you know, it's good to be the queen, right? Queen of highest fitness in this population overall. But if you're not the queen, it's better to um, be a worker for a queen with higher fitness than if you're a solitary. Okay, in this case, because you can produce more offspring, and yes, they're not quite as directly related to you in the fleet in the, in the um, male case, right, and forth, but in the female case, they're more closely related to you. Okay. And you end up having net higher fitness overall. Right. So this is selecting workers then to be sterile and to help their sisters rather than to, to go on their own. Okay. You can also look at um, this experimentally in a, in a test tube, right? So we have a little microcosm experiment. And so <coughs> here are bacteria. And bacteria can produce 
these these enzymes to grab iron from the environment. Okay? And iron's hard to grab, these compounds work well at it, but you have to sort of secrete them into the environment. Right? So <coughs> as if you know to catch fish, I produce fishing nets, I just throw it into the environment, and anyone can use the fishing net. Me, but also my relatives and people nearby. Right? And so <coughs> or I could just not do that at all. Right? Not produce those nets, which are expensive to make. And here I have high and low competition and high and low relatedness between bacteria and culture. Okay, so what do you see? Let's win this plot. Basically, just like Hamilton's rule plotted. Mm -hmm. Like, if R is high and the cost, I guess you would assume a higher cost with higher competition. Yep. Then it's going to be high cooperation and that is the cost of mm -hmm. Right. So you can see how the fortune of cooperation changes through time. Right. And so, you know, if we have this high relatedness and not too high cost, we see the proper cooperation in one. Right. So everyone is producing efficiency with a whole. Of bacteria. Okay. <coughs> and so it's a nice empirical example that shows that this rule can work in real life. Okay. Okay. Help us with the nest. Okay. So in um, many organisms, here we're just looking at mammals, but it happens in birds and stuff too, you might have relatives staying, not reproducing, to stay behind and help raise their siblings. Um, <coughs> or, in some cases, their nieces and nephews. Okay? And so, why might you do that rather than going off to have your own kids? Right? And so, this is looking first of all to see is there a benefit to this um, on the fitness? And so, yes, you know, there's correlation in that helpers do help overall fitness of the breeders. Okay? And since it's related to the breeders, they can help increase, increase their own fitness. Okay? And, you can find in situations where, like, if you go off and form your own nest or form a group, you won't have as many offspring. It's better to devote your resources to your siblings' offspring than to your own. Okay. <coughs> um, and here we see the uh, approach that lead to helping. Right, in some examples. Okay. Um, so, you know, why do you suckle unrelated offspring? So suckling your own offspring makes sense, right? But being a wet nurse to some of your, your neighbor's offspring, what is that, how does that benefit you? Right? Um, and there it's actually thought to be not a fitness thing, but more of a just overall game theory thing. By having more, more individuals in my colony, we get better data, we get sent out more scouts about where they're feeding. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, experience. So, better at reproducing and better at rearing offspring. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, and here other different reports. Okay. Now, if you're trying to, if you can help or not help individuals, one thing that matters is relatedness. Right? So Haldane would kill, would you know sacrifice himself for two brothers or eight cousins. Right? So he's seen people fly, fly in the water. What does he do? Does that have some way of knowing that they're, they're brothers or cousins? Right? And he's a smart guy, he probably can track his relatives. Right? Uh, cousins maybe to well. How does he keep track of that? Right? But now imagine you're an aunt. Right? How could you assess relatedness? How could you assess, okay, here's someone I help, you know, I'll give them food, that sort of thing, here's someone I kill. Smell, how so? And so there's this thing, and it's called calling and odor. Where stuff lives in the same nest, where stuff to smell the same, like being your roommates, right? And <coughs> they can recognize each other as, like, oh, we live in the same nest, we smell the same. Yeah? Um, 
Mm-hmm. They're going to break calls. So, you know, things like calls are learned somewhat. Um, some genetics, some learning. So you can presumably your parents bird call and friends that way. Yeah. I thought you had a question. Any more going? I don't know. I'm not great at seeing, but I think that's pretty fun enough. I know there's any further, but if somebody like you comes in, that's not further fun, I don't know if they smell as well. Oh, yeah, I mean, they're definitely good at smelling. Yeah. And mammals in general, I mean, with humans, you know, we don't think about smell very much, so I mean, the whole like, perfume industry is just the money in it somewhere, so it must be important, right? Um, but we don't, yeah, but we're primarily visual, right? As humans, visual, we're going to smell, smell, smell cinnamon or something, right? But in most mammals, smell is hugely important. I'll use that relatedness. You said visual cues here, you can just look really close to me. Uh, no, so look, so like, know what you look, look like. Again. I'm not sure if that's actually been shown. I mean, there's, there's stuff with the sort of mating, Right, so like I'm big, I mean, other things that are big, you're small, your husband's a bit small. Um, I'm not sure about for helping though, I think sure. Yeah. might be like preyed upon like less food and stuff, and then it's like on a little bit of food. Yeah, that's possible. Right, so orcas, yeah, I mean, they, and then when you have, you know, you have their, I think they actually do name calls as well, like, where they have, like, you know, I am, yeah, you know, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> but right, they have, the orcas, I think mean, it's cool because they have, like, at least in the Pacific, I think, they have three different groups, one that eats salmon, one that is, a, that is, is pretty stationary, one that's sort of migratory, and one that is a whale killer. Yep. Um, also proximity, right? So, um, you know, life goes for efficiency, right? And so, like, I could have a big brain like an orca and be able to say, okay, oh, hi, you're Larry, we're related by our mother's side, right? And that might be the case. But other things are like, oh, we're nearby, maybe we're related. Um, <coughs> and so, you know, things like caterpillars feeding a leaf together, you know, as it causes a lot of eggs, and the caterpillars are all in one leaf together, are probably all related to each other. So you, need to be able to, you don't really need to be able to evolve, you know, ways to check are you, are you related to me or not, because if you're nearby, you're probably related to me, right? And so you can imagine things like that, that, you know, sort of shortcuts, right? Can require a lot of, a lot of um, processing signals like that, okay? But of course, then they're supposed to cheat in. Oh, yeah, something else that looks like you, but parasite. What else might inclusive fitness explain? What sort of weird behaviors we thought we thought about or seen in nature, where you know, for an individual it makes, it makes sense for its own fitness. Why do we think that inclusive fitness does make sense? Well, do you think there are any organisms where certain individuals don't reproduce on those data? Just my experience. Wolves. Mm-hmm. Well, so an alpha, you know, pair that have the pups, and then you have the others that are that don't have pups. Right. Um, and partly it's, you know, it can help raise the pups of this other one and help 
their friends that way. And part of it could be you know, social pressure. Right? And so it could be that the alpha pair dominate and maybe be better for the subordinate pair to produce crops, but they're kept, kept from doing so by pressure from the, from the dominant pair. It's this sort of thing happening in um, there's some wasps where there's competition between the wasps and the one that's like, you know, get the food and she gets the kids and those are sort of workers. But if she's gone, then the next one, the next one will take over. Yeah. What else? Right. And there you can say, okay, is this inclusive fitness or not? So is it that the other males do better by not mating because they can then help defend the females or something? Or is it just that they're losers and they can't mate? Right? And in that case, it's probably the loser example. Right? You could test that. You just find out, you know, maybe ones that are related to the beach master are quite less hard because they have less incentive to win because they have still have, they still have some fitness. It's just better not to, not to damage your cousin. Right, and probably that could be game theory. Even if you're unrelated, right? If two of us together can reproduce, but one of us can reproduce alone can't reproduce at all, then we'll have you know, either half the offspring, but overall we're better off than having zero. That would, so that would work even with R of zero. But if R is not zero, it helps us even more. Yep. Good. How about in things that aren't animals? Stuff like that out there. So. Okay, so that's how, uh, I mean, so plants may be able to recognize the same structure for animals. Yeah. But, but, yeah. But I mean, think about, so but you're right, I mean, plants, you know, they, they couldn't use their roots and recognize relative by signaling through the roots and like that. Right? But also, like, so how would inclusive fitness explain some plant traits? I think in a case where, 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 where we can learn more, we can understand more about plants by thinking about inclusive fitness than by thinking about direct I'm sort of already said it with the roots, but just like plant communication in general. Like, if one plant is being used to like just prevent a bit of like a flood of plants to show up, like the nitrotoxins and all the caterpillar. Yep. And we see that. Man. It's one of the new areas in ecology looking at like how plants communicate to each other. Right? So if I can take my two plants and I mess with this one, the other one is somehow gets a signal through the air that like, oh, this one's being attacked, get ready. Right? And it could just be that, you know, it's like if I if I get cut and bleed, I'm not bleeding to thank you signal, I'm bleeding to then cut. Right? And something else might learn to respond to that signal. But it could also be that you know, those acoustic signals that respond to do better because then their relatives nearby do better. In which case inclusive fitness would explain that. Yep, good. What else? Plants ever help each other directly by giving each other nutrients. Yes. So, um, through mycelial networks, you have nutrients from one plant flow through fungi into your another plant. And so, <coughs> that, um, and that could be due to, you know, just the fungus takes from both and there's some leakage, right? So I might not be sucked it for and it just happened. It could also be that if my relatives tend to be nearby, because that's where I drop my seeds, then if I help them having a bad year, help them establish better, 
then my fitness is increased. So any questions about this? Yeah? It seems like you helping the relative that's close by would still be bad for you because they're close by. And like you, you want all the resources for yourself. You think you're going to want to find an infantry at civil rate. You're right, it depends on how much competition there is between you and your offspring, right? Um, or your relative. So if your relatives are going to overtop you and kill you, then yeah, you know, both are off. Um, but if it's, you know, we're in a, a mixed forest of trees, then maybe it's better to help your neighbors. They're always trying to maximize their own total fitness. And so if helping you help does that, great. If cutting and stabbing in the back does that, great. And if you can if you can, you know, have ways to detect that and to optimize your behavior, then that will evolve as much as you like. Good. Any other questions? Alright, I'll see you on Friday. And keep working on the midterm. <laughs>